We just wrapped up a great episode with Tom McGreevy. He has a small yet mighty portfolio, 13 properties, short-term rentals, long-term rentals. And boy, did he come packed with a lot of experience and knowledge over the past 15 years that he's been investing and in the game. Patrick, what did you think about today's episode? I thought today's episode was great. As always, Tom's first property he got for only $24,000. He's bought some properties for $7,000, $15,000, and his most expensive one, only two hundred and fifteen grand. You guys are going to love it. There's nuggets sprinkled all throughout. Make sure to listen to the end. And with that, here it is. How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to the Real FI Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McGrath, with my co-host, James Ripion. How's it going today? James. I hope it's going pretty good, Patrick. Thank you for that. I want to give a plug to a prior podcast we did. Jeff Higgins, he runs the Fraternity of Excellence. Told you guys on that podcast I was going to join it. I did. It's kicking my ass. It's been a lot of fun. It's been intimidating. Been doing a couple calls with those guys, getting involved. Um, and anyone looking for a change, definitely I'm going to do a plug, shameless plug. Um, it's been a good good change for me. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into today's podcast. We've got Tom McGreevy with us. Tom, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and some of the things that you've got going on in your life currently? Oh, great. It's a pleasure to be here, and I hope uh, my information can help some uh, some of your listeners out there. Uh, my name is Tom McGreevy. I'm from Ohio. I've been investing in real estate since 2008, so I feel like I've been doing this a long time. Um, as I watch other people that just get started um, and they have success in one or two years, I'm like this slow turtle that keeps going and going and going. And I'm, I'm like 15, 16 years later, I'm still here. Um, but I specialize in long-term rentals um, for the past, uh, since 2008. And that was a great time to get started in uh, real estate because there was a lot of foreclosures and people were having a lot of misfortunes um, during that time. So that time was great to buy. In the last couple of years, I've switched over to short-term rentals. So I actually have two of those now. And um, to me, that's where I have the most fun. And uh, I'm, I'm really focusing on that, um, that real estate class now. I like that. Well, that's, that's what great. real estate's about, man, is having fun. Like it shouldn't just be all dollars and cents all the time. So I'm glad you're, you know, making it a kind of a, a business you can enjoy to work on. So that's, that's awesome. Let's, let's, let's get to the short-term rentals kind of in progression with the time that you've been involved with real estate. So let's start with the long-term rentals. You started to get into it in 2008. You know, what was the catalyst that really made you think like, wow, I should, probably look at real estate as an opportunity for me to, you know, invest. So, you know, what got you into real estate to begin with? Yeah. So going back, um, I owe a lot of credit to my dad. Um, he had a couple of rentals growing up and that kind of like pushed me through college, I think. Um, so they put me through college and it was a great experience. And, and I remember going to Los Angeles uh, from Ohio. I wanted to be, be like a movie star type of thing. So I went out to LA after college and I spent one summer at UCLA and trying to find rent out there, like a place to rent was crazy expensive. And you didn't get a parking spot with that, like rent. And that was crazy to me. So I was like, dad, I'm coming back. I'm not going to waste money out here. So I came back to Ohio and that was 2008. And I said, I'm going to buy a real estate, like a like house and rent it out. And because I helped him, like when I was a kid, I'd paint rooms and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I had a lot of that knowledge. I didn't know what I was doing or why I wanted to do it. I just did it. It was like kind of like a side hustle and time that we could spend together working on a house. And um, so I bought my first one in 2008 and, and I'm in Ohio and the market is uh, pretty low prices. So I think that was like $24,000. I got into that first one and I didn't have money at that time because I just got out of college. So I used private money. I didn't even know that was a thing, but my dad loaned me some money. And so um, got it running. You know, it took a lot of work to get it going because it was $24,000 and needed a lot of love. And I slowly paid him back over that time. And uh, I was like, this is pretty cool. And then, you know, another year happened. I found another house. It was like, oh, this is a cheap price. Like, let me buy this house. Like, it was just a hobby. And uh, I feel like now it's like something more than a hobby. Like, it, once you keep buying these and, you know, now I'm up to like 13 long term. 
um, it's like, wow, now what, you know? So kind of like now I'm thinking like, what's the next level? But it was never like a financial thing. It was just something like, hey, this is a cheap house. This is fun. Let's do it. And that's kind of how this thing got started. I really like that. And I, <clears throat> I think a lot of people get caught up in trying to build this big thing from the start. And I, I think people need to just remember that just starting and just adding that one property, because that's one more than you don't have right now and just figuring it out. I mean, uh, how long was it between the time you bought that first one till you bought the second one? I mean, you said you've been investing almost, you know, 16 years now. So you have 13 plus properties. So that's almost one a year, you know? So you, like you said, the, the little turtle, like, was that basically what it was between the first one to the second one? Yeah, it's basically about one a year. I, I've sold one and then the two short-term rentals. So it's a little bit more than one a year. Um, but that's basically what it is. It's just like whenever the opportunity was there and I had the option to buy it, like I had money or I had a HELOC out there that was open, I would take action on it. And that's what a lot of people don't do. Like they don't take action, you know? And that's one of the things like, you can listen, you can talk about it all this all day long. And I see it happen with people. They they talk about it, they want to do it, they want to do it, but they never actually do it. Um, so so it's very key to like take action and, and make yourself available for those opportunities. And I think what's key with what you're saying here is consistent action. I mean, one rental per year for you know the greater of 15 years really puts you in a different spot after you give enough time for all that work and investment to compound on itself. And, you know, it's not just buying that one rental and then giving up and then walking away from the whole experience because you had to invest a little bit more, more money than you expected, or you had some kind of headache tenant, you know, it's staying with it for the long haul, which you have done, which is really impressive. So I think, I think that's, that's awesome. There's a lesson to be learned there. Yeah. And, you know, one of my philosophies is I want to make this rental nice that uh, I would say there. And I've stayed in a couple of my houses um, while I was building my own. Um, so if it's nice that I would stay in there, that's that's like my level, you know, like I'm not going to rent out something that's not. I did one time and it backfired and we can talk about that later. But, um, you know, you you set the expectations and you expect your class of people that you want in there also. And that's really key for longevity, I think. I could not agree more. And my wife and I have had that same exact philosophy from the start for us is I would live in every single one of the properties that I've bought in every single one of the units that I've renovated where I haven't inherited tenants and turned it over yet. And I, I, I love hearing that from someone who's been in, in the game, you know, a lot longer than me is like you said, that rental property is a reflection of you, how you do business and how you want your business to be and the type of tenants that you want to have and the expectations that you have. And I think that's what sets, you know, average landlords and property owners apart from the ones that are going to be long term and successful and less headache free. Yeah, yeah. And and when you are consistent like that, um, you don't have turnover. Like um, that's really key because turnover is horrible, right? You got to redo the place or whatever. And you got a couple months without people there. And if you avoid that, that that's great. Um, so, you know, consistency with the people and also your standards. So that first property you bought, do you still have that property today? I do. And it's interesting that you ask that because, you know, there's a lot of stuff. You guys know the benefits of having real estate. Um, you know, I'm 15 years with this property now. Um, I, I like to get rid of it because it's probably the worst property I ever bought. Um, it's on like the, you know, I'm in a small town, you know, like less than 5,000 people. So there's one school district, you know, I, I, it's funny when people say you want to buy a house in this school district, but you only get one school district in my hometown. So um, it's, it's just not on a great street. Um, the value doesn't appreciate a lot, especially I'm in the Midwest, like Ohio, right? And I'm not talking about the last couple of years appreciation, but normally it doesn't appreciate. So my rent stays the same pretty much. Um, so I'd like to get rid of that. I offered the tenants to buy it from me because, you know, buying that for $24,000 um, 15 years ago, it's now well worth above that, you know? So 
uh, you know, my equity in that and what I'm getting from rent, you know, doesn't really meet. Um, I, if I could sell that, uh, I could 1031 into something bigger and better. And that's what I like to do. Um, it's, and that's one of my struggles is I have a family living there. Right. And if they can't buy it from me, do I sell it to another investor? And hopefully they keep that family in there. Um, because it's, for me, it's more than just like a business, right? Like I'm in a small town. I see my families and, and then Kroger's and the, gro you know, the grocery stores and all that kind of stuff. So it's hard to like, I want to sell this and you guys have to move. Um, but I still have it. It's still, I mean, at this point, it's just free money every month, right? Besides tax and insurance and repairs. How much is that thing worth now after, you know, 15 years, you bought it for 24, 25 grand. What's it worth now? Yeah. So, I mean, I could probably sell for about 110. Um, and, but I'd have to do a little bit of work to it, you know, um, and that would be getting those uh, tenants out of there and, you know, cosmetic stuff to update it a little bit. If I sold it as is probably around 70, 80, but that's just because of the condition that's in now. And what's the rent? Um, so it's 500. I remember when I first rented it out, it was $400 a month. And as a 25 year old, um, $400 a month was like, wow, you know, now that money went back to my dad to pay him off. So I, I you know, I've really never spent the money I made on real estate. Um, I just keep investing it, you know, for the next, next thing. And I'm not sure what the next thing is or when this next thing ever ends, as you guys probably know too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, one of the things I want to get into <clears throat> is let's, let's continually talk about this progression, you know, like, so you bought this one and then the next year later you buy another one and how that that's one of the things that I think some people get caught up in is how you continue to keep buying one a year, you know, even as simple as that, like let, let's break that down for some of the listeners and just talk about your strategy and how you were able to achieve that, you know, of being consistent. Yeah. And, and I have to benefit like the low price points here and the times that we were in back then. Right. So like 2008, like that was a foreclosure and uh, I'm not sure if the, the person passed away or, or whatever hardships during that time and the bank loans a lot of times. So, you know, my average house, I've bought uh, a couple that were $7,000. I bought a couple that was like, well, one that was 10,000. Um, it wasn't until I really bought one for 45,000. I thought that was a lot of money. And, um, you know, that one's probably worth two fifty. 220 ish now, but I thought 45 was a lot back then. And I was like, man, should I do it? Can I do it? Um, and then my last one I bought was 77 here in town. And that was a lot too, but it's definitely appreciated since then. Um, and that's not talking about the short term rental, that's a whole nother ball game. But for me, those price points were low enough where I had uh, like an equity line of credit that I could just say, hey, cash, right? Because foreclosures, you have to have cash. And or back then, and that was before auction.com and the HUD stores and all that kind of stuff. It was a, like a realtor that just had it and they didn't know what to do with it. They had so many. So they were taking like the first offer that came in and, you know, it wasn't that um, there wasn't that many people in real estate like there is now, I feel. And it's just more pressure. But uh, with, the, you know, those price points are, are low where a lot of people could maybe have cash or borrow that much from someone, unlike other parts of the country where that's like unheard of to buy a house. Um, and, you know, I couldn't I couldn't take a loan out during like a like a sheriff's sale. Right. I bought a couple there and that's cash and you have to have it pretty much right then or within 30 days or something like that. So um those that's my strategy and you know i really forced appreciation once i bought it you know i just got it under contract and then and you do the roof you do the paint you do the flooring and the windows all that kind of stuff and the new bathrooms new kitchens to really force that appreciation that's, that's fantastic that's fantastic I, I was gonna say they're they're giving away houses in ohio in 2008 years after the gfc that's insane seven thousand dollars most expensive 77 and that's a recent purchase um so that, that's incredible and that's kind of mind-blowing numbers um and it, it sounds like the barrier to entry was maybe a little lower but you know at the same time that period of time people were scared shitless to get into real estate like a lot of people just saw you know blood in the streets and they just avoided it because a lot of people got their faces ripped off but 
you know, in this market, you, I guess, you know, a risk adverse person could kind of thrive because, you know, you're, you're not getting a traditional loan. You're not going through all the traditional financing mechanisms, more or less buying with cash and then paying off through private money. So that, that seems like it was a great opportunity for you. What were you doing with all right. of these properties as you were acquiring them? Were you, you know, rehabbing them? Did all of them, were they all in need of like major repairs or were they pretty much turnkey when you were picking them up? Um, no, they all pretty much needed some love, um, whether it was a new floor, new bathroom, new new gut this type of thing. Uh, wasn't crazy like structural foundation type stuff. I try to avoid that because that's like a money pit. Um, and a lot of my houses here in, in my town have slate roofs, so they last forever um, until something breaks and then you got to find someone that works on slate, right? But um, so there's a lot of things that I look for. I don't look for structural things where I'm going to have to get a bobcat out there and dig things up. A um, lot like bathrooms, kitchens, that's easy. Um, and that's the point where I have I have a lot of problems with hiring stuff out. Um, I still have this mindset that I can do it. Uh, I'm going to save money by me doing it. And like when I, I bought a hoarder house a few years ago and it was a hoarder house and I did a video and we can talk about that later, but um, it was like a path to walk through the house. And uh, I just started renting uh, dumpsters and I went in there, cleaned it out, had a couple high school kids help me out. I thought I was going to find treasure in there. And um, the, the life lesson was I did not find my retirement money in there. I just spent like five years rehabbing it when I could have just hired people and rented it out for another four years and been ahead and not been to the chiropractor so many times, you know, that kind of stuff. But I'm hard headed. And, uh, you know, there is some passion when you like real estate, you like to get in there, you like to fix things and, and you see the, like, it's part of the process, right? It's not, it's not the ending. Like the ending is fine. You get to rent it out. Someone lives there and that's great. But that's not what I look for. Like, it's a journey. It's a process of doing all this and taking down the deals. You sound like me. I, I mean, <laughs> that's that's literally exactly what I do. I know James is smirking over there, but like, I I enjoy working on the properties. I enjoy doing the, like, seeing the before and afters and transforming it and knowing that I got to use, like, my hands and, you know, design it and everything. And like you said, it's it's the challenge. I think that's like the journey, the challenge, that's, that's the fun part at the end of the day. Like sometimes I just forget about some of these properties, you know, my wife hasn't even been to a couple of them or like <laughs> even actually seen them besides showing pictures. Like once they're rented out and you've, you've renovated them and everything, like you're really, you're, it's kind of forgotten about until an issue happens really. Right, right. And if you're, if you're, if you have the standards, you know, you got the right people in there, it's, it's passive. Now watch me get a phone call later today, like so this happened, right? But uh, as long as you prepare the house, it's pretty much passive besides going to collect the rent and that kind of stuff. That's really, I, I really love that. And this, this is really great for, for all of our listeners out there just talking about the passion because a lot of people push that passive part about it or, hey, hire everything out, you know, uh, buy, buy whatever property and appreciation and all of that. And it's like, well, for some guys, that's not the case for some people. It is one a year and do the work themselves, you know, and spend six months or a year on the renovation instead of three, you know, but you sliced the amount of money that you're putting into this thing, you know, by two thirds, you know, I, I, I just bought a sixplex last year and you know, I spent like 25 grand on people to go in there and do it real quick. Well, they did most of it real quick. And then I still spent two or three months finishing everything myself because when I started getting the bills, I was like, oh my God, like yeah. time out. Like I can do this or, or hire it out myself, you know? So it's like, you got to have that balance, but it's really nice to just hear somebody else that, you know, is, is successful and has been successful for the listeners out there that is doing the work themselves you know, slow grinding it out, you know, James, what do you think? I, I think that's incredible. And I think, you know, the, you got to balance the penny wise pound foolish uh, motto with having pride in, in the ownership of your assets. And, you know, there's, there's a middle ground for everybody and you just got to got to figure out what works best for you. And it, it sounds like all of your properties are in a small town 
they're probably pretty close together. Like you might have like a pretty good relationship with your tenants. That hands-on aspect is great for certain investors because you get to manage your, your asset closely. You make it kind of a job for yourself and it gives you some fulfillment. You know, a lot of people strive to get that retirement uh, FI status uh, and they... Sorry about that. And they uh, just take for granted, like the fact that they need to have some fulfillment in life uh, to get by. You know, it's not all about just sitting on sitting at the beach, which you are doing today, Tom. Uh, you're at the beach today. It's not all about that. Like you're going to go back to reality, back to your systems and back to your daily life that gives you fulfillment. But, you know, I think having your hands on it gives you something to wake up every day to to do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I don't want to take all credit because I do hire things out. Like I have a guy that helps me a lot that does drywall because that's not fun for me and I'm not good at it. There's some skills that I don't, I'm not good and I'm not going to pretend that I'm good. you know, if there's a plumbing issue, I got my guy, I'll call, but uh, you know, cosmetic stuff, uh, grunt work and you know, I do some stuff. So I'd like to touch base on that a little bit because I am the same. I'm terrible at drywall and I hate painting. <laughs> But I will do it, you know, I will do it. But like those, like those two things I really hate doing. But like installing a vanity, installing light fixtures, changing out outlets and, you know, kitchen cabinets and stuff like that. Flooring, I I don't do any of that stuff, any major electrical stuff. But for for me and for some of the listeners out there, like what's some of the stuff that you take care of? And that you do that has helped, you know, you that you can do and that saves on the cost of when you're renovating these properties. You know, I think for listeners, they have to value what their time is worth, right? Like if if my if I say my hourly rate is fifty dollars an hour, well, if it's you know cheaper than that, then I should get someone to do that. Um, or you know, how that how that works out. But for me, it's like you get to pick what you want to do. If if I want to lay floor, then I'll go lay the floor. And I used to like, I used to do that in my my prime years, like twenties and thirties, right? Uh, I hit forty this year, so now I'm like trying to work on the back and make sure I don't do stupid stuff anymore. And I'm sure my mom will appreciate that when she's listening. <laughs> but um, you know, there's there's things that I do. I, I recently bought a spray gun, and that's uh, that's kind of like therapeutic like when you get that fresh drywall dust out of there and you just put the primer on there and just go to town and then um so that that helps out as long as you're like masking everything off and then um you know painting i you know there's days i don't want to go like after i work like i'm tired of physically emotionally or whatever but um as long as you go and do a little bit kind of like the gym like some people don't want to go to the gym and you once you get there you're okay it's the same thing with the house pro like i don't wake up every day like yes you know like i have days where i'm like i don't want to and uh we don't get crazy great weather in ohio so when it's a nice day do you really want to be inside painting um but you know when i design kitchens um, i'm not installing the kitchens i'll have my guys do that the countertops really anything like uh fixtures i'll buy the nice fixtures because why buy the cheap plastic one it's going to break so you're still paying the guy to install it why is why not and do the better the quality that's going to hold up over time um you know ceiling fans um I'll, I'll buy it and put them there and say let's put these up um that kind of stuff so exactly um, Exactly. As, as you were talking, um, Patrick, I had the, I had the same question in my mind, and then Patrick messages me on the side. And I'm like, "Wow, we both picked up on that." Do you have a full time job outside of your management of all the rentals that you've got going on? Like you're you're doing all this all this labor, all this work, all the management, the lease ups, the move outs. You got a full time job in addition to all this? Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I got a full-time job. I've been um, with my school for, this will be year 16. Um, I'm a high school principal at a vocational school. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's amazing. I, one thing is we need more vo vocational schools. So I think that is awesome. Uh, second question is, um, do you, are, are you talking to your students and the people at the vocational school about real estate? And do, do they know anything about that? Do you share that with them at all? Um, I don't push it because I'm not like trying to get like, like, I don't say, hey, check out my Instagram or whatever, right? You know, but there are kids that pick that up. 
and they have fun with it. We talk about it. And when they're in my office or whatever, we'll, we'll talk like real life because that's what we teach. Like you're going to get a skill. We're teaching you a skill for two years. You're going to hopefully use it. And then what, you know, you, you might make uh, $10 an hour, or you might be a welder making $50 out, uh, out of high school welding on the pipeline. Yeah, you can afford that nice big truck and, and get the lift kit on it, right? Um, but are you managing your money? Like we, we talk about that. And, um, you know, I, th I feel like life skills and financial literacy is a huge thing that a lot of schools are missing out on. And uh, we, because that's what it boils down to. You're going to get a paycheck and you're going to have a job. And then what? How do you manage that? I want to I want to dig in on this a little bit further, because, you know, I've I'm an overeducated person myself, um, got a graduate degree. I've got a son that I'm raising. We've got another one on the way soon. My son's 13 months old. And I constantly have this thought of like, you know, damn, college is way too expensive and seemingly not even worth it. And, you know, you've got all these trades and these industries that seemingly make a lot more money than people coming out of college. And it's something that's severely overlooked, like and underappreciated. You know, give us a little bit of background about, you know, your philosophy of vocational training and, you know, the things that you're doing to help kids, you know, choose maybe what is today an unconventional path. Uh, whereas, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that was just standard. People were productive and they did produ productive things. Now we're just, um, as my father likes to say, a bunch of overeducated dumbasses, um, you know, that don't really produce much. So, you know, give, give us your little right. philosophy on the vocational trading and everything uh, that goes along with that. Yeah. So when I, gra I graduated in high school in 2001 and, uh, you know, I did not go to vocational school. I think we visited type of thing. Um, but really my, you know, everyone, all my friend group, they were going to college. I was like the thing. So I was like, well, I'll go to college too. And, uh, I went for the band because I really liked the band. So I did the, the band there in college and, uh, that really helped me, you know, push me through some things. But I think my parents really wanted me to go to college because they never got that opportunity. And I think that was a different set of times back in like the fifties and sixties, right? Like, you, you really wanted to be pushed to college to get those jobs and, and have that company take care of you for after you retire type of thing. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really thought about it. And then um, I started, I got my teaching degree and I started teaching there, um, a job opened up there. And so I, I taught for many years and then I became the principal, assistant principal and principal and so on. So I had my summers off a lot in the beginning to work on houses and that kind of stuff. But I, I believe in it. There's a lot of skills out there. There's good jobs that you can get um, without the financial burden. Like take a, a 18 year old and say, hey, you're going to have $100,000 in debt or whatever, you know, like sign up here. OK, like I believe in so much. Uh, I have a 18 year old and he finished his first year this past year at my school. It's a two. We have a two year program it's for juniors and seniors in high school. And so he's going to be finishing up this year. Hopefully he can get an internship and start making money this this senior year, you know, and already be prepared and making great money right out of school. And we've uh, we've talked about uh, getting his credit in line and what he would do to get started, like in real estate, uh, as long as he wants to. Like, I'm not going to push him, but I feel like real estate is a great um, avenue to pursue if you want uh, some financial freedom or just extra money. Exactly. Exactly. And I love that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're helping to guide, you know, the next generation of electricians, plumbers, construction, you know, framer guys, mechanics, welders, all of that. I mean, uh, I, I, you hear these stats all the time, you know, the average electrician plumber is in their fifties and for every three or four that are retiring, there's only one coming in to replace them. Okay. So Soon we're going to have a ton of lawyers and no electricians and plumbers, right, James? Yeah, um, don't even get me started on that, man. I mean, it's, it's a problem. It's that it's the real pandemic, if you ask me. I mean, Patrick now, you know, hit it on the head right there. And I think another, you know, another industry that's really lacking and young people coming up in is surveyors. I don't know if you guys have ever had to get a survey recently, but like in my area, there's there's no one under fifty, and I mean literally under 50 that can do a survey. So, 
you know, that's another opportunity for those out there looking for some kind of career path that is actually going to pay them well. And that more importantly, you can start a business with, you know, a lot of people go get college degrees and they're working for the man, they're a cog in the wheel, and they probably hate themselves working at a desk, pushing around paper and numbers, doing something that's ultimately going to be outsourced to either AI or somebody, you know, that in a country that's being paid much less than them. But, you know, you're working with your hands, you learn the skill, you're ultimately putting yourself in a position where you can start a business, grow a business, and then at the end of the day, acquire massive wealth, okay? So, you know, that's just my my opinion on that, for whatever it's worth. So, Tom, let's uh, let's talk about your numbers with your current portfolio. Like, how much rent rental income are you bringing in net gross? Um, you said you have, I think, thirteen long term rentals, two short term rentals. Um, give us the numbers, and then maybe we'll get into the short term rental side of thing as well, because we want to talk about that as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have 13 long-term rentals and I'm rehabbing two of them right now. So they're not uh, rented out. And I'm thinking about um, selling one of those to do a 1031 into something bigger. Um, I've never done that. And I kind of regret um, selling the one earlier in my portfolio, but, you know, um, it's around eight grand coming in uh, from uh, long-term rentals. Um, that number will grow some once I get the other one on, up and, and rent it out. Um, and then, you know, the short-term rental is a whole nother ball game. Um, you know, it's, it's not consistent. You never know what you're going to get. Um, long-term is pretty consistent. You know, you can, you can have people move out and life happens. Right. But most part, you know, they're going to be there all year and they're going to pay the rent. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so eight grand between, you know, 10 or nine of them being rented out. So, I mean, that's fantastic. And then, where are these short-term rentals located, you know, and uh, how long have you been doing this and what, what was really the, the shift there? Yeah. So it was about two years ago. Um, I was sitting in the living room, dining room table or whatever. And um, after a while, like, I just, I'm a little bored of buying the single family house in my hometown and doing the same thing over and over again. Right. And getting the same results. Like, it's great, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of burnt out a little bit. So was there something different that I could do? And that's the only thing I knew, right? Single family. I think a lot of people get started because that's like the easiest avenue and what most people know. And most people can't look at like, oh, there's a 30 unit apartment complex. I I'm going to buy it. Like that's owned by, you know, these big groups of people and that's not me. So um, I was sitting at the table and I looked over my, my wife and I said, uh, you want to do short-term rentals? Like, and I wish I would have thought of this like before, <laughs> but uh, she's like, I don't know. And I said, well, there's this course I could join and, and uh, you know, they, they, they'll teach us, you know, I have all this background on long, long term, but I don't know anything about short term. And, you know, it's a little entry to pay and hopefully we'll learn something out of it. So we ended up joining a, a program and um, it paid for itself uh, totally. Totally. It's, it's awesome. I got so much knowledge out of that. And um, one of the big, big reasons um, that I enjoy it also is because my wife loves to design and have that part of it. So it's just not me. Like she hates the houses I buy. Like, you know, like she does not want to walk in there when the floor is out and it smells like I'm like, that smells like money. Right. But she's like, no, but these short term rentals are nice. They're kind of nicer than our own house. And, um, and on the amenities, when we buy amenities, like a hot tub, she's like, can we get one in our house? Like, I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not going to make money. Like, what are you, are you crazy? <laughs> but, uh, so, so joining the program and learning about it, um, really helped because, you know, that automation is key. I think, especially when you have, um, real estate out of state, which I've never had before. And these are out of state. So what was the program that you got involved with and, and what did it teach you that really helped you with your short-term rental business? Yeah, so uh, Rob from um, Bigger Pockets had a program out there, uh, Host Camp. And um, I joined when it first came out. And um, I was like, this is either crazy or, you know, I'm going to waste a few thousand, it was, you know, a couple thousand dollars, but um, it paid off big. Uh, the amount of people I got to meet 
and learn from. And, and he, he was a great mentor and um, I still look up and I still listen to his stuff and, and try to be better because I'm always learning. I'm, I'm never like, I don't ever want to be the smartest person in the room. You've heard that, right? So I always like uh, try to network and, and learn and just listen from people. So that, that program, um, I think it's still out there and um, people are still joining it. That's great. That's great. So where, where did you end up? When and where did you end up getting your first short-term rental? I want to say it was about a year and a half ago, December, um, we started looking and um, I went whitewater rafting one time in college and it was in West Virginia. And I said, you know, New River Gorge, it's a new national park. Um, let's go down there. So I started looking there and we, we, it took a couple months looking and trying to find the right property, you know, like I didn't want to hit a base hit. I wanted to hit a home run. And so I started looking around and we went, we drove down there. It's a few hours from our house um, in Ohio. So we drove down there, looked at it, made an offer and was really, really excited. So that was our first one. And then, um, you know, as we wanted to enjoy it, it, it got rented out. So we couldn't like enjoy it. So we got another one so we can go down there and hopefully enjoy it out, which we did. Um, and we made some videos of us doing some activities down there. But uh, we're in West Virginia at the National Park. That's that's great. That's great. So let's talk about these properties a little bit. Are they cabins on a mountain? You know, is it, are they condos? You said they have hot tubs and stuff. So I'm assuming they're, they're houses. Like, let's let's talk about these a little bit and what uh what makes them you know a great investment for you guys for short term yeah so um i never do anything with hoas um i'm not i'm sure there's hoas in ohio but nothing around me right i know there's a lot in other areas uh, i don't do condos or i i want full control of my asset you know i don't want people to say hey you're, we're putting in a new kitchen give us thirty thousand dollars <laughs> cuz that's scary and not i like to control um so i wish was cool um, houses like cabins or really neat um, things, but they're just nice houses. Um, I have bigger houses with more bedrooms. I like four bedrooms. Um, I like a family setting instead of just like a, a couple's retreat because, um, you know, you heard the thing heads and beds, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but for me, I just like the space and the family setting and the atmosphere. So mine are just typical houses. Uh, for me, I don't like just a cookie cutter house. I, I want a little bit of charm or like, oh, that looks pretty and in a nice location. So uh, it's always about location with me. Um, and and um, so those are the houses I have right now. So I know you're not spending that $7,000 a pop on on these short term rentals. So what, what was your purchase price uh, for these properties that you're getting into for the short term rental business? Yeah, so the first one, uh, they wanted like 225 and that was in December uh, 21, I guess. Um, and I was like, man, should we should we go lower or should we just give them the asking price? Because that was a lot of money. Uh, that's a lot of money still. And um, even though, you know, I'm not paying cash like I was. So it's like the bank's like paying most of it. I just had to come up. And I did the first one was a 10% um, second home. You know, that was like the cheapest way to get into it. So I could probably get into it for like twenty some thousand dollars. So it was two fifteen. They took it. I only went ten under, but they took it, and I'm so grateful now because now, like a year and a half later, the appreciation, you know, is crazy. And I know it's not like that all the time, but um, I'm like, wow, I'm glad I got in then. And I find myself saying, I'm glad I did this then. Like, you know, you always people don't say, I wish I didn't buy that house most of the time. I should say. But uh, I always find myself, I should have bought this or I should, you know, I look in uh, when I, I've been looking in Ohio also, we have a state park here that's pretty popular. And I made a couple offers and never got it. And I'm like, man, I should have, because now I see them and what they've done with them. I'm like, that could have been me. Like hindsight is crazy. It is. It is. I think I, I, <clears throat> I remember back in 2015, 16 and 17, when I was, looking to get my first rental property when there was foreclosures everywhere. I don't know how many properties that I lost for like $5,000. Like 
They want 155. I'm not paying a cent over 150. You know, I got to get a good deal for my first property. And those houses right now are $400,000 houses, you know? So I love that you said that. It's like sometimes if you're going to do it, just do what the hat says. Decide, commit, take the action, like go a little bit under. If they snuff at you and come back full price, like just go for it, you know? Like you said, if most of the time, you know, it's going to work out in the long run with real estate. So 225. All right. So you get into this place for 215. You're 20 grand in. How much was it for, you know, your furniture, all your amenities, all that kind of stuff to get this thing up and running? Yeah. So it was like uh, around 35 because I got a hot tub. Um, you know, you need to know your amenities for that area. And so the hot tub was expensive. Um, and then, you know, you average your square feet you know, 10 to 15 bucks a uh, square foot for your area there. Um, so it was about 35,000 to get uh, furnished. And and that was all new to me, right? Because like you, we, we don't furnish long-term rentals. And now, you know, not only do I have hot water tanks and, and all this other stuff, I got beds and sheets and coffee makers and stuff I've never had to buy before. That's wild. That's wild. <laughs> so how much is, how much is this place renting out for now? Like just on, on an average nightly basis, like what do you what are you guys getting? It's uh it, it depends on the season and all that. Um, I would say between three and five hundred bucks in that range, uh, when when it gets rented out. Wow, so that's over one percent. Uh, yeah, like one almost one percent of the purchase price. That's crazy. So you're, I mean, you're getting like, you know, two to. Two to five, three. That's that's wild. I'm just kind of shocked here. Like, wow, that thing that I, that thing's doing pretty good. So, with your two short term rentals, so you were grossing about eight k a month with your long term. With your two short term rentals, is that almost like double then? So, for me, I I've never really like tracked numbers. Like, I don't know. This is where like I'm I'm not too good because I just you know I bought houses, I'm renting them out, and all that money just goes back and you know pays for other other things and so i did make a spreadsheet and i was kind of seeing where i'm at on rent and taxes and insurance and and it all depends like how much you know i get that rented out but when i when i did the math with how much i put into it and how much i paid for it and what we made um it was a very good cash on cash return and so that made me want to say okay well maybe we can go back and do it again it's it's definitely more fun than uh than a long-term rental um because not only are you having the cash flow but you get to make memories with your family right uh you get to enjoy it but then you read the notes that the people leave and uh they make memories like they're there for their brother's wedding or whatever and they had such a great time and to me long term you don't hear about those things you know like you only hear hey the commode's leaking again or whatever um you know it happens daily, but you don't get to enjoy those. Uh, I think I went off topic. What was the to- what was the question there? <laughs> no, that was absolutely perfect. That was absolutely perfect. I was just asking about your, you know, your return or cash on cash or whatever. Like, but I I love the fact that you talked about. Hey, I know it's working. I don't really focus on the numbers too much. I just keep reinvesting into my business, and I really that that's perfect too. Like sometimes it doesn't need to be all focused on the numbers and absolutely maximizing the revenue out of everything and nitpicking on everything. And, you know, because it's not all about the money. And I love that you talked about the memories of people and the memories with your family and, and getting, you know, pulling the heartstrings a little bit on why you, why you're doing this and why it makes it fun and interesting. Like we talked about before with the journey. So I, I think yeah. that's great. And as you, you talk about that, that's kind of where I'm at now. Like, do am I maximizing my my properties? Because I've always had a W-2 as like a safety net. Like that that check's coming in, you know, I can live on that or I can cover that payment type of thing. So, you know, I've been able to not gamble because I know what I'm doing, but I've been able to kind of take more risk and 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 things like that. So now I'm kind of looking at like, okay, if I do run these numbers, do things make sense for me 
to sell this property and and do something like this to get those numbers to uh, come up where my W two numbers are, that maybe I am in a financially okay situation. <clears throat> But I've never thought about that because that's never been like the end game for me. Like I didn't know it was a possibility to be just a real estate investor. And that's what you do full time. Like to me, that's crazy that um, that's a possibility. And and that's getting in those rooms with people and networking and saying, oh, you quit your job and oh, you were scared too. And it worked out for you. Like, okay, what do you do to prepare? You know, and that's that's a key thing for a lot of people. Well, I think that's a great point and a great time for us to transition into kind of outlining what, what your goals are with your real estate portfolio mm -hmm. and maybe even transitioning that into your W-2. Like where, where are you trying to take your long-term, short-term rental business and um, everything like that? Like, are you trying to acquire more units? Or are you just trying to maximize return, 1031? Like what's the bigger picture goal uh, for where you're trying to go? Yeah. So like for me, it's never been like, I want to get a hundred doors or anything like that. Cause I've never thought about it, but like, if I could get a, a certain number per month that I could live off and save money and be happy and, and know my kids are set. Uh, I think that's where I'm at and, and say, you know, 10,000 a month, if I can achieve that number, then, and, you know, what happens with the other 40, 50 hours of the, of the week that I would get back? Like, you know, we always look, I, I've seen this time, I've seen this so many times, like we always think of the negative, like what if this happens and like it doesn't work out, right? And I see all these like reels and things like, but what if it does? And like, but that's, that's a big chance. No one thinks about the positive. We're always scared and look at look at the negative. So for me, if, if I can trade in some long terms, which is hard because I have people living there and it's affordable for these people that I know, and trade into something bigger, uh, better, whether short term or multi units. I've never done multi units, but I can see the possibilities and in, in scaling that way. I think that would be uh, fun. I don't know if multi families are fun um, and then short term, but something like that where because I, I manage everything. So maybe if your hands off, it's OK. It's just another source of income every month. Um, but, um, you know. If I could get that number, I think that would be a goal for me. And I'm not sure Great. if I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that, that's fantastic. I I re I really do uh like like your your strategy through this. It's just been, hey, we're gonna buy one rental a year, we're gonna keep going, let's change things up and try this short-term rental thing. And it sounds like it's been successful. And because of the short-term rentals and they have been successful, now you're looking at the rest of your portfolio and going, hey, well, instead of buying four more long-term rentals, we could just get one or two more short-term rentals and that would offset and I might be there. I might be able to retire in the next two to three, five years. And, you know, so I, I love that right now is when you're actually thinking about all of that stuff and you've been doing this for so long. So I, I think that, uh, that that's great. And, uh, I really want to ask like, what's, what is like your biggest motivation, like moving forward to have these thoughts and be thinking about kind of switching strategies a little bit and focusing more on certain areas? Like what, what's that motivation b behind you? Yeah. So, um, you know, Facebook is great, but it comes up with memories. So you ever like you go through Facebook and then like five years ago and you look back and you're so I have uh, an 18 year old and, and two uh, other kids that are nine and eight. And uh, I'll see them like baby talking in the swimming pool. Like when we were here, like a couple of years ago, like where did that time go? Like, like everything's going so fast. And, you know, in your 20s and 30s, you think you have all this time and and uh and you look back and you're like at that time you're like oh, i got everything to do and now you look back and like man that was before i had kids and uh, family stuff so time is more um it, it's more i don't know what the word is but it's more valuable for me because i don't we don't know how much time we have you know my dad passed at 71 so if i'm on the same track I'm already halfway through, right? So like, I want to maximize my time. I want to be happy. I want my my family to be set. Um, 
those are my whys. Like, I just want to be healthy and happy and, and have time to enjoy it. Um, you know, I went through midlife crisis, like 40, like this year. And uh, I, I was stupid. I went out and bought a car and I was like, darn it. That's what you don't do <laughs> when you, when you want this, but you do have to enjoy some things. Right. And, and um, so I, I guess I'm enjoying that, but I do want to focus on uh, paying down some, um, some Hela box or stuff that just doesn't make sense at the rate they're at right now you know maybe you can save money you can make more money by maybe paying stuff some stuff down instead of going and buying more stuff like you have to kind of look at your stuff and um i i did remember one other thing you were asking how did you get some of the finances get in some of these deals but for the short term i didn't have that 10 percent um money to get into the house um but i did have a Tesla that I had and I loved, I loved that thing, and uh, I ended up selling it because the car market was so crazy that I got money back. So I sold an asset or not an asset; it was a liability, right? And to buy this asset now that produces money, now that I can go buy that uh, fancy luxury car that I love and can enjoy. Um, but that was a sacrifice that you know some people aren't willing to do or don't want to do. I mean, that's all investing is. Exactly. It's counterbalancing opportunity costs and, you know, weighing out, you know, where should your money be? You know, at, at the time when you bought the Tesla, it might have been an efficient purchase and then car prices went nuts and you have this real estate business going and, you know, it's more appropriately allocated to your business than sitting in four wheels on your driveway for 95% of the car's lifetime. So, you know, I think that's that's kind of the trade off that needs to be made, especially with your comment about paying off debt. You know, that can that can yield a good ROI as well. It's not always about paying or buying the next property. Sometimes it can be paying down debt uh, and then freeing up that equity to use at a future time when opportunity presents itself. So, you know, I think that's super valuable. What obstacles are you facing? as you're working to try to replace your W-2 income and grow your portfolio? Yeah, so one of the last times I went to the bank to get a loan, um, my debt to income ratio was like, what are you trying to do? I'm like, I'm just trying, you can say no. Like, So I do have that uh, factor, um, debt to income ratio is not working out for another loan. And plus I'm getting to that magic number of 10 uh, loans that you can have. Um, so that's an obstacle too. So um, for me, like I said, I'm, I want to look at private money um, or doing the 1031 and exchanging what I have that's kind of like maxed out right now and taking that money and getting something bigger and better um, that we can also enjoy and that's going to make money. So the 1031 is something I, I, I know about 70% of it and I want to try that. Uh, I'm I, I told you I sold one of my houses and I regret that from day one. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I made great money, but that money is no longer, I don't know where it's at, right? Because it's it, it's sold. And um, so that I regret that so much. <laughs> uh, I understand where you're coming from. I have completed a 1031 exchange and I will let you know that you can actually do a combined 1031 exchange. So I was able to sell two properties and combine them into a 1031 exchange to buy my 10 unit apartment building. So I sold two and used that money as the down payment for the apartment building. So, you know, you would be able to combine a couple of those properties if you wanted to into a much larger purchase, you know, tax, tax deferred, not tax free for everybody out there listening. You know, you, you just kicking the can down the road, but it sounds like you got a couple of things to look into, but they're all good problems to have. You, you know, it's all about building your, your portfolio, building that time freedom. So I think that's amazing. I think you've dropped a ton of nuggets and insights throughout this entire podcast on a completely different perspective than we've really had on the show about how you can build of substantial portfolio and some nice cash flow just buying, you know, one rental a year. So with that, I think this is a perfect transition into the next segment of the show that we call the big, the big four. four. James, take it away. All right, Tom, I want you to tell us something that you do that is a financial independence hack, something that's a cheat code for your personal finances. 
So for me, um, and if you're beginning uh, into real estate or whatever, maybe this isn't for you, but um, I don't save money. And so like, if you were to pull up my savings account, um, there's no money there to be saved. Um, I don't like having money just sit, sit there because it makes nothing. Um, so my money would go back to paying off a loan or a repair or this next ha uh, rehab that we're doing um, or pay down a HELOC, which then you can basically use. Um, it's kind of like a glorified credit card. And uh, but the money sitting there in savings account, I know a lot of people that have like 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars just sitting there um, or even more. And um, it just I, I don't understand. Um, but maybe they don't want that risk tolerance. And they're just they're just happy with that money sitting there. But for me, um, I don't say that it just goes into something to make another project better or to pay down a HELOC always investing. I, I think that is a great hack right there and a great little cheat code for everyone listening. All right. Number two, we call this one resources. So are there any particular books, podcast, or people that have really shaped your financial independence journey, your real estate journey, your mindset journey that maybe has uh, struck a chord with you that our listeners may never have heard of before? Yeah. Um, well, for me, you know, going back to my dad, that's a personal thing. Um, but if you're starting out, like local meetups are great. I've never, I, I never thought about doing that. Uh, I went to one, one other time and I was like, wow, I gained some knowledge. Like I thought maybe like, I didn't know what, was, what to expect, but you're around the same minded people. And I think that's so key when you're in that, in that group. Um, I'm a big podcast person. So I, I, you know, besides you guys, I, I listen to, um, Am I, am I, is it okay to mention all the ones I listen yeah, to? Yeah, okay. name away. All right, so uh, Rental Income Podcast, uh, Dan Lane does that one. That's a pretty good one. Um, Bigger Pockets, of course. Um, STR Secrets um, with Mike and E. And um, on the market with Dave Meyer, I think he has a lot of great information on what to look for in the, in the markets in the future. Um, and of course, real estate rookies uh, with Tony and Ashley, um, even though I'm not like a rookie, but um, there's like nothing in between bigger pockets and the rookie like, and that's where I feel like I'm at sometimes. Um, and a big shout out to, of course, Rob from Rob Built, um, who did host camp and led me on this journey for short term rentals. Awesome, awesome, Perfect. awesome, awesome. James, number three. Tom, it's five years in the future. What does your life look like, personal side of things, uh, maybe even at your W-2, being a principal, or for your business? Um, realistically, it, it probably looks like the same thing, um, where I'm just keep building and keep grinding, um, and I'm still probably working because um, that is a scary ledge to jump off of when you, um, and especially when you enjoy it. Um, so I just want to be healthy, happy, and see my kids grow um and uh spend more time with them you know and uh get to see all the moments and then the double-edged swords as you uh get to relive those and you miss those moments with with the kids and the family so uh, that's that's probably what i'll be doing i love it <clears throat> i love it you know where you're at you know where you're headed and you're just going to continue to keep building on top of that so man tom i think this has been great our last one is where do our listeners get in touch with you? You know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, like drop all, all your best places. If they feel motivated, inspired, educated from you, you know, where can they reach out? Uh, mostly Instagram, one rental a year. Um, it's pretty easy, one rental a year. Um, I did do the YouTube for a while, but then like you, you have to film it, you have to go to Final Cut and there's just a lot of stuff there. So mostly the Instagram reels, it's real easy as I'm working just to click and, and go at it. So that's it. Just one rental a year. All right, guys. Well, if you were motivated, if you feel inspired, make sure to go give Tom a follow one rental a year. And you guys know the drill. If you like this podcast, if you hated this podcast, do something and leave us a review. Check out our website, therealfi.com, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel yet? We're almost at 500 subscribers. We'd really appreciate it if you subscribe, like this video, comment underneath, and 
with that, we'll catch you next time. See ya. See you guys.